You've probably heard of Hatsune Miku, a Japanese celebrity, larger than life, famous in every corner of the globe. She's partnered with Domino's Pizza, she's shared airtime with Scarlett Johansson, she's even performed at Coachella, and importantly for our purposes, she's got her own video games. What sets Miku apart, of course, is that she isn't human. Hatsune Miku is a Vocaloid, a virtual singing software produced by Yamaha. The particular character of Hatsune Miku, like all Vocaloids, comes with a particular voice bank, which is created by taking vocal samples from a human singer. Miku's voice was created with the voice of actress and singer Fujita Saki. So, using a Vocaloid to create music is like using a digital instrument instead of a human singer, and each Vocaloid has a distinct voice. As with choosing any instrument, choosing a Vocaloid is a creative choice. Miku is one of a series of Vocaloids created by a company called Krypton Future Media. Her name combines Hatsu, meaning first, Ne, meaning sound, and Miku, meaning future. So her name means the first sound of the future. For many, she represents an exciting foray into the future of music and its expressive possibilities. In popular culture, Hatsune Miku is known to many for upbeat songs like World Is Mine, and many of her fellow Vocaloids aren't really known about at all. But there are thousands of people out there creating a diverse array of music using a Vocaloid, and Vocaloid music has its own subculture, in Japan and all over the world. While some songs fit with this pop star image of the character, many Vocaloid songs explore themes of alienation and mental illness, explicitly linking these feelings to capitalism and to systems of oppression. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the rhythm game Project Diva Future Tone. We're going to explore how the songs and music videos in this game confront capitalism and disability. How does the Vocaloid software allow musicians to engage with these themes in unique ways? Ways that many producers feel they couldn't with so-called real singers? And how do we confront the irony that Project Diva is part of the money-making machine tied to both Vocaloid subculture and to the gaming industry? Hi, I'm Sara, pronouns she, they, and welcome to Game Assist. Today, I'm incredibly excited to bring you our first collaborative video with one of our beloved patrons. As a top tier patron of Game Assist, you get to guest star in our content in any way that you feel comfortable. So without further ado, I'll let our guest star introduce herself. Hi, my name is B, and my pronouns are she, her. For this video, B played a huge part in research and writing, shaping the creative direction and content. At its core, this is a joint project between the two of us. If you aren't a Patreon already, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash gameassistyt, and remember to hit that subscribe button before we dive in. As we'll be discussing a rhythm game with no overarching narrative, there are no spoilers to worry about in this video. There are, however, some trigger warnings to make note of. In this video, we'll be discussing ableism and disableism, compulsory heterosexuality and queer phobia, specifically lesbophobia, mental illness, and suicide and suicidal ideation. There will also be depictions of clowns and syringes and other medical equipment on screen. In our previous video on disability, gender, and agency in Life is Strange, we created a working definition of disability, which is as follows. Having a physical or mental impairment, a neurological or developmental condition, or any combination of the above which, with or without official medical documentation, has affected you or will affect you in the long term. 
These effects may or may not include the necessity for medication, the requirement of specialized support, but may also include the effects of discrimination and exclusion by society. This definition is underpinned by the social model of disability, in contrast to the medical model. The medical model of disability essentially says that there is something wrong with an individual because of their impairments, and the individual must overcome, cure, or fix their impairments. In contrast, the social model says that it is our society which is wrong because it's structured to exclude and enact violence on people because of their impairments. The social model allows us to understand that our society is abled or ableist, that is, it favours non-disabled people, and it is also disabledist, that is, it actively harms and causes violence towards people with impairments. Our world was never fundamentally designed with impaired people in mind, and it needs to be radically restructured in order to be accessible. Importantly, our definition of disability includes mental as well as physical impairments. With this in mind, if it's society which disables people rather than their impairments, then capitalism disables people. To explain, Neoliberal capitalism refers to a 20th and 21st century economic system defined by a liberal, free market economy. It's the economic system that many of us live under, certainly here in the UK, in many European countries, and abroad in the US and Japan. Policies minimise government funding and give power to private corporations. A key aspect of neoliberalism, as opposed to the 19th century economic liberalism of the Industrial Revolution, is globalization. Globalization is the trend towards deregulating markets on a global scale, becoming increasingly reliant on trade between nations. Meanwhile, borders prevent people from moving in the same way as goods, and the violence of border control continues. But that's a conversation for another time. This system of global capitalism has come into place because historical and present-day colonialism has spread this economic system created in the West abroad during the height of the empire. A Western narrative of progress tells us that capitalism spreading to the global south turns countries into developed nations, and this is part of the project of neo-colonialism today. The implications of neoliberal capitalism on essential services such as healthcare are its increasing privatisation. The government doesn't invest in healthcare, instead private companies charge money for essential resources. In this medical system, disabled people are denied autonomy over their own bodies because most medical professionals are non-disabled people, and it's medical professionals who restrict access to resources. They are able to do this not only by requiring proof of your impairment, but by charging money for it. In this video, we'll be discussing a Japanese game and a primarily Japanese cultural phenomenon, so it's important to offer some context into the Japanese medical system's approach to disability, particularly mental illness, which will be our focus. Similar to the US, thanks to global capitalism, in Japan, the material cost of healthcare, including mental healthcare, is very high. According to Japan Healthcare Info, even with health insurance, there are high costs attached to consultations and to medication, and health insurance doesn't even cover counselling. Regarding cultural attitudes and material realities of living with mental illness in Japan, Makoto Kagayama, a former volunteer at Aokigahara Forest, which is one of the world's most used suicide sites, says, most people who suffer from mental illness just hide it. You get told as a kid that you have to be successful and follow a path where you have to make your family proud and be the best while not standing out from a social point of view. So people just hide their pain. Not handling pain is kind of like a sign of weakness, and most people who actually try and get help do it secretly. In fact, most psychiatrists in Japan usually make their offices look modest and very hidden so that the patients can go there without others realising they are going to a psychiatrist. Capitalism, then, also disables people in the sense that it can cause or exacerbate impairments. 
Regarding mental illness, a culture which encourages one to measure their value on academic or financial success affects one's sense of self-worth and is linked to depression and anxiety. Furthermore, if one is not shown as productive, contributing to society and maintaining the status quo, they are othered and perceived as weak. In the context of global capitalism, of course, these are not issues which are exclusive to Japan, but it is important to avoid projecting or imposing Western understandings on others. While doing research for this essay, we've been as mindful as possible of the fact that neither of us are Japanese and have no lived experience of living with mental illness in this context. We've made an effort to draw directly from Japanese or diaspora sources, either written in or translated into English, where possible. Now to bring a little Marxist theory into the mix, to demonstrate one of the ways in which capitalism disables people. Alienation, a key concept we'll be discussing in this essay, is essentially a separation of two things where there should be a relationship between them. This can be a relationship between the subject and object, yourself and your work, or the product of your work, or subject and subject, yourself and other people, or even yourself and yourself. This can manifest physically, for example, being physically alienated from someone because of geographical distance, but here we'll be discussing it more in psychological terms. For example, you might not feel alienated from someone you are physically distant from, because you still feel emotionally connected to them. In Marxist theory, alienation is the separation of labour from oneself and one's human nature, as a result of being forced into and exploited by a hierarchical class system. While human nature is a contested term, here it refers to your interactions and relationships with the world around you and with other people. So, being exploited under capitalism causes you to be alienated from yourself, those around you, and the world you live in. This is because you are forced to do work for the purpose of survival. You don't feel good about it, it isn't for your own emotional enrichment or for your community or environment, it's just something you have to do. Think about how people aren't able to take time for themselves and their communities because they have to work to survive, or how, for a lot of people, even if they're doing work they used to enjoy as a hobby, doing it for money sucks the enjoyment out of it. In a capitalist society, the worker is an object, not a person or subject. You lose your agency because you have no choice but to do work, often work that has no personal value to you. You are alienated from the act of working and also the product of your labour which are both decontextualized from your reality outside of work. The separation of your human nature from the work you spend eight or more hours a day doing has clear implications on your mental health, as we discussed a bit earlier. While you work, you are suppressing parts of yourself and being someone you're not, up until you stop for the day. With the line between work and not work continuing to blur, for example with monetizing your hobbies, or with your employer contacting you through your phone outside of working hours, the worker is liable to lose their agency and direction in life, even outside of their work, because they have to consistently play the worker, the object, not the subject. The disconnect between labour and reality, another contested term, but in this context meaning life outside of work, is especially emphasised for mentally ill people. Alienation forces you into a liminal state, where you feel like you're never allowed to truly exist outside the mindset of labour, resulting in depression and anxiety. If you have a mental illness which limits your ability to work in a capitalist society, especially if your workplace isn't accessible for someone with your impairments, you're seen as less valuable, which creates a feedback loop. Mentally ill people struggle more with working and their failure to contribute to capitalism exacerbates their mental health issues. They could also feel ashamed about accessing support, because they are only measured as worthy when they are productive, and accessing mental health support can be stigmatised. It is also worth considering the widespread notion that if someone's mental health issues don't affect their productivity, they aren't deserving of help, because if they can contribute to capitalism, it is not worth improving other areas of their life. 
As a final note, due to alienation, workers don't have the psychological energy or capacity to pour into nurturing themselves and their communities, which helps capitalism because we don't have time to organize, fight back, and not merely survive, but thrive. All of these concepts are central to our argument in this essay. Project Diva Future Tone is a game which exists within the capitalist context of Vocaloid subculture, which is highly profitable to games, video, and music companies alike. In spite, or perhaps because of this context, both the promotional videos, or PVs, and the songs themselves within Future Tone explore the link between mental illness and capitalism, particularly through the lens of alienation, demonstrating that capitalism does indeed disable people. In this essay, we'll do some close analysis of a few of the songs and videos within Future Tone, and we'll discuss the tension between the political context of the game's production and the radical anti-capitalist possibilities that its content presents. The first song we'll be analysing is Wawaka's Rolling Girl, one of the most famous Vocaloid songs of all time. The Future Tone promotional video, or PV, allows us to interpret Rolling Girl as a song about how women's mental health is tied to structures of oppression, namely global capitalism, which at their core are traceable to the legacies of Western civilizations. Outside of the Western world, possibly nowhere embodies global capitalism so much as Japan. The themes surrounding education and the motif of rolling are particularly significant in this song and in this video. The opening shot in the Future Tone PB is of Hatsune Miku wearing a seifuku, a modern Japanese school uniform based on a sailor suit, the idea of which was taken from the clothing worn by children coming from royal European families. The safe crew partners with the Gakuran, the military uniform for boys, and illustrates that school in Japan is designed to maintain the status quo and its oppressive and violent structure. In gameplay, it is possible to change the outfits Vocaloids wear, but each PV has a recommended outfit. The use of the school uniform, as well as the fact that the video takes place within a school, centers the education system and Miku's role in it as the subject at hand. The colours in the PV are muted, except for a few specific elements, such as Miku's trademark blue ponytails, eyes, and a few details on her uniform. In this opening shot, she's focused on playing a powerful riff, as if it's therapeutic. This is an interesting image to begin with. The context of the education system's disregard for art as a viable pathway, due to the fact that it isn't productive, is juxtaposed with the use of music to channel one's feelings. The setting of a music classroom in particular does more than juxtapose, it uncomfortably meshes the conflicting themes of art and capitalist education. Here, the education system has attempted to tame the radical power of art. Miku looks into middle distance for a split second as she stops playing, a sad and knowing look, as if she is aware that playing the piano is a protective bubble that she has to step away from. That is, art and music can't save you from the capitalist system that school is gearing you up to enter. Once she gets up, she makes gestures of frustration and mental turmoil. She's holding her head in her hands, singing about how her dreams are out of reach, how the thoughts in her head keep spinning around, reflected in the build-up and continuation of the riff she was playing. Before Miku leaves the classroom, she kicks the piano stool to the ground and hurls music stands away from her, like she knows that art can't give her the escape she really needs, especially when she slams her fists down on the piano in defeat. She can't just take joy in art, because it's not productive. As she leaves the music classroom, the pictures looking down on her on the wall are white male Western composers, signifying that even in music, she is trapped in a colonialist narrative. This isn't the only Western colonial imagery in the song, we'll come back to that later. Miku moves through the school like she's trying to reclaim it, to break free of the hold the education system has on her. She dances through the halls, knocks things down, strikes poses in chairs, the sort of thing people do on the last day of secondary school when they're about to leave, when they're no longer under the school's control. 
Miku also sings about keeping quiet about her bad mental health, even though she's hearing so many voices that they blend together, linking back to Japanese societal attitudes around mental health that we've discussed. She can't afford to seem weak, mentally ill, unable to contribute to capitalism. When she obsesses over her past mistakes and how much of a failure she is, she just feels even worse about herself, and capitalism enables this cycle to make people feel worthless and irredeemable for being miserable under a system that reduces us to objects for production and strips away our humanity. The motif of rolling, as in the song title, is everywhere. It's in the piano riff, in Miku's spinning thoughts, in the action that she has to do just one more time. She keeps telling herself just one more time, but it never is. How many times have we told ourselves, I just need to get through this week, only to have the cycle repeat again and again? Capitalism brainwashes us into thinking that it will only be one more time, and the repetitive nature of labour and of rolling makes it easier for workers to be tricked. The rolling metaphor is very well encompassed in the idea of being a cog in the machine, which is what Miku is being trained to be. She's being trained to roll, and despite what she's been told, she can't ever stop. You literally don't stop rolling unless you burn out, and if that happens, you'll be left behind. The metaphor of rolling, pressing yourself into an unnatural shape and gritting your teeth, is used to illustrate the self-alienation you have to go through under capitalism that starts as early as a child's education. Importantly, the character of Hatsune Miku is a 16-year-old girl, demonstrating how young girls are subjected to capitalist violence that's even infiltrated forms of self-expression, like music and art. After she leaves the music classroom, the image of Western masculine supremacy and colonialism is brought back, in an art classroom of all places, where Miku has a conversation with a Greco-Roman bust, the epitome of neoclassical colonial ambition. She asks, one more time? And he replies, not yet, we can't see what's ahead, hold your breath, telling her that she just has to keep striving, living with the pain of rolling and holding her breath, and then she'll make it and won't have to do that anymore. Physically, when you're in a rolling position, you have to restrict your breathing, your true self, otherwise you get hurt. This conversation could well be the voices in Miku's head repeating the capitalist messages that she's been taught. Or that the bust is a manifestation and voice of capitalism itself, persisting throughout history. Miku pushes the bust off its stand, as if to reject its idea, a small act of rebellion against the system and the bust breaks on the floor. This is when, instead of acting like she owns the place, Miku starts to run. She backs away, frightened, as the camera pans up from the ruins of the bust. Now that she's disturbed the universe, as it were, she can't go back to being complacent. She has to escape. She keeps looking behind her like she's scared of getting caught. We can see more colour as Miku tentatively walks through a hallway filled with bright pink neon overhead lights and arrows guiding her. She sings that this is how it all ends, because she's unable to reach the colours on the other side, the happiness that the bus told her she'd get. The introduction of more colour creates the impression there's hope for Miku, but capitalism creates the myth that we live in a meritocracy and erases the reality of structural inequality. So when you don't get what you've worked for, you blame yourself and become even more alienated from yourself and the world around you. This is proven when Miku bursts through the back door of the library, and there is no colour, no other side, just the upward climb that invites mistakes. Importantly, this isn't just an upward climb, it's a spiralling, rolling staircase. The theme of false meritocracy is especially emphasised here, as Miku begs to be set rolling, to be set on the path to a success she'll never get, a success that will come at the cost of her happiness and sense of self. She keeps running and stumbling and desperately reaching out, the stairs crashing down before she's even reached them. She was told it would be just a little further, that it would be just one more time, but she was lied to. She begs to be set rolling with her intense silence, indicating that since she didn't do enough to fight back, her silence is complicity, and she's perceived as begging to become a rolling cog in the capitalist machine. 
In the final seconds of the PV, as the steps fall down beneath her feet and she falls with them, Miku rolls through the air, surrounded by sheets of music, keyboards, music stands, easels, everything that once represented self-expression but got swallowed by the education system, an agent of capitalism. At the end of all these steps is a light, and this light is never what you want it to be. As the sky turns blue, the conversation Miku has with her voices no longer ends with hold your breath, but with stop breathing. Now that Miku is plummeting, she's seen enough to know that capitalism is a scam, but not enough to know that there's any way out. In fact, capitalism thrives on the idea that there is no other system and no other way. So Miku sees that she either has to choose capitalism or death. These two terrible options highlight the inability to get healthcare and support within a capitalist system, and that this is systematic. Capitalism has told Miku to be productive or die, and capitalism is what's created the repetitive thought patterns that serve to make her suffer and keep rolling until she just can't. The next song we'll be looking at is Cosmo's Hatsune Miku no Shoshitsu, Dead End, known in English as The Disappearance of Hatsune Miku. B wrote this segment, but unfortunately had some technical issues with recording, so I'll be reading it on her behalf. It's been theorized that this song was created after Google and Yahoo blocked the phrase Hatsune Miku for suspected spam, since so many people were researching her after the Vocaloid software was first released in 2007. At 240 beats per minute, this is one of the fastest Vocaloid songs ever made. A lot of it sounds like Miku is spitting out system code. The speed at which she's singing here suggests urgency and desperation conscious of her lack of time, a distinctly human reaction to her impending end or her mortality. This brings the line between human and android into question, as does Miku discussing her own identity as a singer and making meta-references to the Vocaloid program. Her end is specifically imagined in the context of her being a program. Listeners have theorized that the software user is deleting her, and this is how it appears in the original PV, but it has also been theorized that a virus is eating away at her, or she's losing control, so she wants to get deleted so as not to disappoint the software user. When you get a job, that's what your life revolves around, like you've been designated a specific function, similar to that of a program. The alienation you undergo means that you are afraid of your life being worth nothing if you are not productive in your job. If you can't contribute, capitalism doesn't provide you with basic necessities and leaves you for dead. Miku is already dying, and while she's being deleted, no one else has control over her singing and her creative expression. This time period is a liminal space between life and death, because she's not dead yet, but is in the process of being uninstalled. Existing in this liminal space is what allows her creative control in her final moments, when previously she could only sing songs that were made for her. The Future Tone PV opens in grayscale, with Miku slowly standing up from a crouch on a rickety metal ruin, laden with beaten up lights that flicker on and off a direct comparison to her failing software and her fragile mental state. The setting of the dark night with the huge full moon is significant, as it invokes the dying and disappearance of light, especially when this death is preceded by a final song. The huge moon, as a quintessential symbol of the night, creates a sombre ambience and makes us feel that this song is not going to end happily. The word shoshitsu in the title has connotations of fading and dying out, not a quick termination. This suggests a degree of self-awareness to Miku in the sense that she can feel herself dying. She says, Anything I have resembling a soul has vanished. Although resembling is a key word here, separation of human nature from a worker like Miku is never done all at once. It creeps up on you. Vocaloid identity, non-human identity, is very important to disappearance, particularly because a vocaloid is something which is not human, but looks and sounds human, 
or like it's trying to approximate humanness. This is definitely a factor in the widespread fame of this song, since it was the first big Vocaloid hit to deal with this theme. Only a few other Vocaloid songs, such as Kokoro by Kagamine Ren, also in Future Tone, capitalize on the unique nature of androids and the ethics surrounding android singers. Here, Vocaloid identity draws a parallel with the idea of lacking something that you need in order for the rest of the world to see you as worthy and desirable. According to Miku, living forever is what would make her life as a Vocaloid as equal to a human's as possible, since it's the one thing she could do that a human can't. But the degradation of her software means no longer being able to work, so is directly equal to her death. She will always be lesser, and she cannot change that. This can be closely compared to a disabled person being unable to work under capitalism, and therefore being seen as disposable, or growing old and being unable to work, and feeling useless because alienation has separated you from your human nature. The character of the Vocaloid as an android, a program attempting to replicate a human, is used as a powerful metaphor for self-alienation. The first line of the song is, Ever since I was born, I knew from that day that I was nothing more than a simulation. And we can infer that Miku has been using her singing, her labor, as a coping mechanism to distract herself from this knowledge, from the feeling that she's still not good enough, and that when she is forgotten by everyone, she will lose a kind of heart. Everyone under capitalism is defined by their labour, and since some disabled people cannot be as productive, others are prone to overworking and burning out, either due to internalised disabilism so as not to fail under capitalism, or as a distraction from their other difficulties. As a Vocaloid, Miku giving herself to someone else is mandatory, and her worth is defined by her productivity as a singing programme. This fits right into Miku's narrative of self-alienation. She was born into a capitalist condition in which she never had any agency in the first place. The video shows her giving her final swan song, even miming trying to break out of walls at the end, as she says, I want to believe that it wasn't in vain that I sang up to the last moment, even if I know I can never be equal to a human being. Miku quite literally has to work and be good at her job to survive, and she knows it. Miku tells us, I once found such joy in these songs, why is it now that I don't feel a thing? This is characteristic of the alienation that happens when you start relying on not only doing mundane labour, but even using doing what you love as labour because you need to survive. As well as feeling alienated from herself and her singing, Miku feels alienated in interpersonal relationships. She sings about how much she wants to make the software user happy, and how the only way she can do this is by singing well. This reflects an alienated relationship between employer and employee, but as the relationship between Miku and the software user is romance-coded, she sings, Each time I remember your gentle face, I feel a moment's calm. It is also reflective of the imbalance of emotional and physical labour which is expected from women in heterosexual relationships. The parallel between employer-employee and romantic couple shows us that, under capitalism, alienation is generated in interpersonal relationships because they are transactional. You try so hard to be good enough through physical and emotional labour for a partner or an employer that you become miserable in the process, and the cycle repeats. Miku tells us that she is a personality changing with every song, furthering the point that her persona changes to accommodate what users of the Vocaloid software want from her, and she suppresses her true self. As previously discussed, this reflects how, under capitalism, we base our identity and our worth entirely on the work we do and our productivity, and become alienated from our reality outside of work. As a Vocaloid, Miku doesn't have a choice but to work and obey if she wants to live, and, if you think about it, neither do we in the capitalist system we live in. In this PV, and in Miku's classic design, the number 01 is tattooed in red on her right shoulder, invoking the dystopian trope of numbering all of your employees or prisoners. 
This extends to the other Vocaloids in the Krypton series released after Miku. Kagamine Rin and Len both bear the number 02, and Megarine Luka the number 03. We'll be telling you a bit more about these guys later. The disappearance of Hatsune Miku reflects its focus on Vocaloid identity and the style of the song too. Vocaloid software is often praised for sounding lifelike, and depending on how the producer of the song decides to tune what they're working on, it can sound very smooth and human, or jarring and robotic, or anything in between. Here, the producer, Cosmo, is way over on the far robot end of the spectrum, and, as I've said before, much of the song sounds like Miku is spitting out system code, a breakdown. She even says that she's dissolving into ones and zeros. Although we've established that the literal context of the song is Miku's uninstallation, this breakdown could also be taken as a metaphor for finally cracking under the pressure of capitalism, especially since Miku seems to be fully aware of what she's going through, but has no power to stop it. The mechanics of Miku's breakdown markedly show that she is a program that can snap under too much pressure, just like any human worker breaking out of customer service mode when they just can't do it anymore. There is irony in the sense that Miku tells the listener she has simply been singing the songs given to her, but parts of the song shift from the super fast robot tones into something much more melodic and human sounding. This suggests that this breakdown has in fact given her a way to express her feelings, both in spitting out system code and in song, when she hasn't been able to do this before. Of course, it's important to keep in mind that the mental illness makes people more creative trope is damaging, but like the end of Rolling Girl, this song explores the limits of capitalism on creative expression, and the possibilities that death or other forms of escape from this oppressive structure might have. Perhaps Miku is resigned to her deletion, and this is a metaphor for finally being able to say what you couldn't before, as you slam the door to your boss's office, especially if she knew it was time for her to go. Next is Iroha Sasaki's Roshin Yukai, which literally translates to nuclear meltdown, or simply meltdown as it's usually called in English. The Vocaloid used in this song isn't Hatsune Miku, so anyone new to Vocaloid might not know who she is. Meltdown is sung by Kagamine Rin, who usually appears with Kagamine Len. Both Rin and Len's voice banks are sourced by the same voice actress, Shimoda Asami. They were originally conceptualized as twins and usually appear as such, but they also appear as lovers and sometimes even as different forms of the same person. As an example, check out Alluring Secret Black Vow for Rin and Len as a gay gender fluid angel. Even though the twin thing wasn't finalized, the idea is so embedded in Vocaloid culture at this point that it does just feel weird and uncomfortable to see them as lovers. In any case, although their voice banks are sold separately, Ren and Len usually appear together in songs, and they're usually singing something adorable and really sweet when they do. Here, Rin is flying solo, and as in many of her other solo songs, she's emo as all hell. The name Kagamine derives from Kagami, meaning mirror, and Ne, meaning sound, which is particularly interesting to consider when we think of alienation. Even if Rin is on her own here, images of reflective surfaces are prominent. The most interesting thing about Meltdown and its particular approach towards portraying disability is its central image of nuclear meltdown. Whether literal or figurative, this is a song about suicidal ideation, with Rin singing about wanting to throw herself into a nuclear reactor. But why a nuclear reactor? In the West, at least, this certainly isn't one of the more traditional images associated with suicide. In his book, Noir Urbanism's Dystopic Images of the Modern City, 
William M. Tsutsui maps out the history of apocalyptic representations in Japanese culture since 1945, the year the US dropped nuclear bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Historically, even before 1945, for over 500 years, Tokyo has been destroyed and rebuilt by man-made and natural disasters alike, more than any other city in the world. Tsutsui argues that in these stories and images, Tokyo represents the Japanese nation as a whole, and the destruction and resurrection of Tokyo in exactly the same form is emblematic of the immortality of the nation. He argues that Apocalypse serves to reaffirm faith in the status quo and in linear narratives of progress, showing us that the Japanese establishment, the state, the military, the intellectual elites, are dependable, benevolent, and competent. Therefore, they will endure and survive just as they are. Tokyo as a symbol for modern, enduring, progressive Japan is timeless and self-healing. Narratives like your favourite existential nightmare anime, Neon Genesis Evangelion, might complicate that. But in any case, whether these images of Apocalypse affirm the status quo, trivialise real-life events, or provide an artistic means of processing the trauma of nuclear devastation, Apocalypse narratives have huge political significance in Japan. In Meltdown, then, the significance of nuclear as opposed to monster or zombie apocalypse is that it's a kind of man-made destruction, specific to the modern era. It's clearly political and grounded in contemporary reality. Nuclear power is linked in complex ways to a capitalist economy, as well as its destruction of land and life. So, the fact that Rin imagines taking her life by diving into a nuclear reactor, by ending her own life through nuclear devastation, offers fertile ground to connect an individual's lived experience of mental illness and suicidal ideation to oppressive structures of power in neoliberal Japan. Now, let's take a closer look at the song in Project Diva Future Tone. Meltdown's opening lyrics describe a town filled with a bright light, which has an anaesthetic effect. Rin dreams of strangling someone, surrounded by an overflowing light, and expresses her desire to jump into a nuclear reactor so that her memories will fade. In the Future Tone PV, we are greeted with an opening shot of a cityscape. Within seconds, we're torn from the city and thrust into a liminal space, or a space in between. It also seems like a space outside, on the outskirts, a space which is marginal and other. The city itself is now only occasionally visible in the distance. This liminal space that we're in is physically in ruins, peppered with broken columns and pipes. The ground, which seems to be made of concrete, is covered by a shallow pool of water, with more water still falling from rooftops rather than from any natural source. In the air, there are these strange technological apparitions, or holograms, made up of squares, loading bars, numbers and letters, all in a cool blue. Amidst this scenery, Rin dances. This version of the song is significantly shorter than the original by about two minutes, so it doesn't tell a story in the same way as the original PV, but we're dealing with similar themes and images here. Images of the city, described and visualized in terms of its towers and bright lights, invokes Tokyo, therefore representing modern, neoliberal Japan as a whole. The idea of these lights as having an anaesthetic effect might allude to the way in which capitalist materialism may alleviate or numb your pain temporarily, while on an individual level there is still underlying trauma, and on a systemic level the foundations of structural inequality still exist. That escape isn't something that's immediately accessible to Rin, because she's positioned outside of the city and is othered. Surrounded by water's reflective surface and hovering apparitions of what Rin is, a program, there is no escaping herself here. Perhaps she's only able to conceive of alleviating her pain in capitalist terms by throwing herself into a nuclear reactor. Perhaps she can't see any possibility to truly embrace and work through her mental illness and trauma under capitalism, so she wants to end her life. 
In the closing lyrics of Meltdown, Rin thinks that the world would be a better place without her in it. She sees herself as a burden in a capitalist world which teaches her to measure her worth on productivity. She will be more productive in death than in life, as her death will literally fuel the nuclear machine. I think there are subversive possibilities in this song, though. During the bridge, Rin describes the second hand on the clock and the officials on the TV, invoking linear time and modern technology and culture. But her words contrast the visual space, which is one of liminality. Rin is in a place outside of the anaesthetic comforts of the city, which, though beautiful, are violent. Broken pipes and ruined columns might represent a space where those structures of power are punctured and there are possibilities to build something entirely new. Water and its connection to the moon invoke lunar, flowing, shifting time, rather than the numerical, ordered, forward movement of the linear time that capitalism imposes on the natural world. While it might be painful that this reflective surface holds a mirror to her, self-awareness can allow one to grow, move forward, fight back. After all, water not only reflects, it moves. Like Miku in Rolling Girl and Disappearance, there is a kind of freedom, even a kind of resistance, in the death that Rin sings about. She sings about wanting to strangle someone. In the original PV, this is a younger version of herself. And considering the song's themes about suicide, it would make sense that this could be a kind of self-hatred, an alienation from herself. In the context of capitalism, this could represent the way in which society makes us project hatred towards ourselves for not being productive, rather than at the system for enacting violence on us. Due to the content of the original PV, it has been argued that Rin doesn't literally want to die, Rather, she wants to purge herself of childishness or childhood trauma. You can't grow as a person, learn from your mistakes, or gain awareness if you kill any part of yourself, especially the messy parts. But capitalism requires you to suppress these parts of yourself in order to be productive. At the end of the original video, though, Rin holds hands with her younger self, embracing rather than killing her. So perhaps hopeful possibilities are in store. When Rin sings about a third presence, a laughter and a voice that she can't see, perhaps this is the first sound of the future. Coupled with the importance of the shifting reflective surface of water, as well as the name Kagamine, meaning mirror sound or echo, it is clear that self-alienation, suicide ideation, therefore disability, and capitalism are all deeply interwoven. As I mentioned earlier, the presence of holograms in the Future Tone PV seems to imply that Rin's being a Vocaloid is significant too. Perhaps it is in her non-humanness, her otherness and marginality, both as a disabled person and as an android, that she is able to reflect on herself and her role within capitalism, even as she is a product of and a commodity within it. For our final bit of close analysis, we're going back to Wawaka, producer of Rolling Girl. In this segment, I'm going to take a close look at two songs on Unhappy Refrain, the album featuring Rolling Girl, in order to develop the argument that we mentioned earlier that the self-alienation caused by capitalism has implications on interpersonal relationships. This plays out particularly in the way that capitalism is interwoven with cis-heteropatriarchy and uses compulsory heterosexuality, or the idea that heterosexuality is socially constructed as necessary and obligatory, in order to enforce violence and maintain structures of power. Ura Omote Lovers, translated in Future Tone to Two-Sided Lovers and sometimes translated to Two-Faced Lovers, like most of the tracks on this album, is a Hatsune Miku solo. World's End Dancehall, meanwhile, is one of only two duets on Wawaka's album featuring another Vocaloid named Megarine Luca. 
Interestingly, Luca was originally designed to be the first Vocaloid that Krypton would release, capable of singing in both Japanese and English, and was going to be called Hatsune Miku. However, the concept was put on hold, and she was released third in the series, after Rin and Len, with a new name. Her surname combines Meguri, meaning circulate, and Ne, meaning sound. Luka combines Ru, meaning flow, and Ka, which can mean song or scent. So the sense of her name is sound and scent, which circulates. The concept is a sound or a scent or a feeling, which can travel across the world because it can be translated into different languages. Turning back to Wawaka's album, it's worth noting that Miku and Luca's other duet, Reversible Song, also seems to address relationships and feelings of emptiness and alienation. In the broader context of Vocaloid subculture, there is further important context in the choice of these Vocaloids as a pair. By the time World's End Dancehall was first published on Nico Nico, the Japanese video streaming site where most Vocaloid numbers have made their debut, in May 2010, it had been a year since Minato's Magnet had been released in May 2009. Magnet is a tragic lesbian tour de force, with Miku and Luca singing passionately about desiring each other, keeping their relationship a secret, and struggling with internalized homophobia. It was definitely partly responsible for my own gay awakening, but I have mixed feelings about it now. I definitely recommend checking it out in your own time. In any case, Magnet popularized Miku and Luca as a romantic pairing, not just in fandom, but amongst Vocaloid producers. There are some great songs out there using this pairing to explore queer relationships and lived experiences of lesbophobia. So using Miku and Luca as a pair has political significance, and Wawaka would likely have been aware of that. In Project Diva Future Tone, the PVs for Two Sided Lovers and World's End Dancehall are visually connected to one another in a way that they aren't connected to the other Wawaka songs in the game, that is, Rolling Girl and Unhappy Refrain. In the game, Miku and Luca have matching outfits named Conflict or Conflicted, which are the recommended or canon outfits for both songs. The video for World's End Dance Hall also contains a visual callback to Two Sided Lovers, where one of the environments from Two Sided Lovers makes an appearance. This environment has a checkered background, enormous balancing scales, and the words love and lovers in huge text across the screen, as well as a strong blue and pink colour motif. For my close reading, I'm going to focus on Two Sided Lovers first. There's a lot happening in this song, and it's all happening very quickly, both in the video and in the song itself. As I've mentioned, there's a strong blue and pink colour motif. The video is full of silhouettes and two-dimensional shapes, which Miku stands in stark contrast to. Miku is singing about waking up and being taken over by a thing called love, which seems to splinter her sense of self. She talks about her heart space splitting in two, her two-sided heart, her topsy-turvy self. Accompanying these lyrics, in the PV, Miku is shown sitting across from herself at a table, or a shadow of a table. And later, at the same table, her two selves are sitting facing opposite directions, one towards the screen and one away from the screen, like a shadow self, or a part of herself that she hides. This resonates with earlier discussions about suppressing a part of yourself within a capitalist system, but this time with a particular focus on suppressing a part of yourself in order to fit into a construct of what romantic or sexual relationships should look like. A strong connection is established between alienation from self and alienation from others, indicating that they have similar causes, or at least exist in the same sociopolitical context. One of the key motifs in this song is the inability to emotionally connect with others, or to convey emotions through words, and Miku's character seems to be trying to supplement emotional connection with physical connection. She is just touching by instinct, with nothing to say. Sexual imagery is punctuated by pain, by a lack of fulfilment. While touching, gasping, and feeling like she could climb to heaven, she's still hurting, still feels stuck going nowhere. 
The way she experiences relationships through the pleasure of sex doesn't seem to bring her emotional fulfillment. The sense of self-alienation explored earlier in Wawaka's album with Rolling Girl also affects Miku's relationships with others. The original PV for Two-Sided Lovers, uploaded to Nico Nico in 2009, creates a strong visual emphasis on cis-heterosexual relationships, sex, and importantly, reproduction. For most of the video, the screen is split in half, with one side inverting the grey and white colour scheme of the other. There's the letter M and the letter F, the male and female gender symbols, images of growing seedlings, of ovaries, of expanding bellies, syringes and surgical face masks. This imagery is a lot less overt in the Future Tone video, but there is one part where Miku gestures towards her womb and the camera frames this part of her body alone, reducing her to her reproductive function. Additionally, the bed silhouette from the beginning of the video is revealed to be a hospital bed after the first chorus, continuing the motif of reducing women to their reproductive function. This is an extension of how capitalism reduces people to their productivity and creates self-alienation. The Future Tone PV develops a visual motif of romantic or sexual relationships in a capitalist context, making one feel trapped. There are images of Miku being boxed, an interesting play on the immense popularity of Hatsune Miku character figurines, which creates a direct link between capitalism and her feelings of alienation. There is also a darkened version of the Love Lovers environment with enormous chains hanging in the background, and a transition from this environment into the next with silhouettes of prison bars covering the screen, emphasising that she feels trapped. But it isn't love that's the problem. By all indications, the problem is the cis-heteropatriarchal configuration of human relations. A system which enforces compulsory heterosexuality, which reduces women to the reproductive functions of their bodies. This is an extension of capitalism, because a capitalist, cis-heteropatriarchal model of human relations is transactional, reducing these relations to their productivity, policing sex and bodies in order to further patriarchal ownership of land and capital. Check out our video on bisexuality as a game mechanic for more on this. The lyrics about sticking them over your retinas adds an extra dimension, critiquing the ubiquity of heterosexuality in visual media culture and revealing it as violent. In an interview with Webdice about the release of the album Unhappy Refrain in 2011, Wawaka discussed the femininity of the album and his reason for using Vocaloid. He said, When I make a song, I'm always preparing a heroine, or a protagonist at least. I decide a major theme for each song and make the lyrics such that the theme can be extracted. Every time, without fail, I make sure there's something, a sense of loss, a sense of uneasiness, a hazy feeling. I always picture in my head the girl propped up against a wall between her and the world, and from there I write. In that way, I suppose the album has a single thread of consistency. It's always a girl? The interviewer asked. Well, Vocaloid has female voices, so why not? As if you had a female singer singing a song, then. It's not quite like that. I don't know how to say it. Yes, in my case, it's female vocals, but I also think Hatsune Miku singing gives it a certain bit of persuasiveness. But even if I were to temporarily sing for myself, I think the same kind of worldview would remain. There's influences from the music I listen to. For the feminine parts, I kind of like feelings that tie into puberty and rebellion. So I create along those lines. I try to put the haziness of an I'm all by myself in the world feeling into the lyrics. Interestingly, the claim that Vocaloid has female voices is a bit more complicated than it appears at first. There were at least three male Vocaloids in circulation at this point in 2011. Kagamine Len, who we mentioned before, 
an earlier Vocaloid developed by Yamaha and distributed by Krypton named Kaito, the guy with the blue hair that you'll have seen in Project Diva, and a Vocaloid developed by Internet Co. Limited named Kamui Gakupo. In the Krypton series, Kaito's abysmal sales of only 500 units in 2006 led to Krypton focusing on the market for female Vocaloids. Len's popularity, in contrast, seems to be in his partnership with Rin, his young boyishness, and perhaps the fact that he is voiced by a woman. And Gakupo definitely isn't as popular as his female counterpart, Gumi. Using a female Vocaloid is still a creative choice, but the point that the Vocaloid voice is a female one is well taken, and it's very interesting. From this interview, it's clear that for Wawaka, conveying a sense of alienation, a feeling alone against the world, is not only about women's experiences of and resistance to cis-heteropatriarchy, it's also something that Hatsune Miku, as an android singing voice, has particular power to convey. Two-Sided Lovers is a song about how capitalism is interwoven with cis-heteropatriarchy, creating not only self-alienation, but alienation from other people, because this system of power configures romance and sex as needing to serve a reproductive purpose, and reinforces violence, particularly on women, through compulsory heterosexuality. World's End Dance Hall draws out these themes in unique ways because it portrays Miku and Luca as a romantic couple. In this song, the love that these young women have found is in their shared feelings of pain and self-alienation. They sing about the meaninglessness of life and the restlessness that they feel, and they seem to take enjoyment in dancing while the world ends, in spite of, or perhaps because, of this pain. Their dancing is about becoming dizzy, feeling intoxicated, the world getting high, drinking in all of this apocalypticism. It's running away from the world they know and dancing on its ashes, sharing in the intoxication that brings them together. It's important to say, of course, that at least at first blush that doesn't sound like a healthy relationship and it shouldn't be romanticized. In this song, there's a lot of circular movement, Sometimes the camera orbits Miku and Luca as they dance, and in their own movements they circle one another, seemingly unable to touch. This creates an interesting link to Magnet, as the dance sequence for that song in Future Tone also emphasises the image of the two circling around one another, because their love is forbidden and they aren't supposed to consummate it. And of course, this motif takes us back to Rolling Girl as well, with its very clear connection between the image of rolling and circling and the idea of capitalist productivity. The video for World's End Dance Hall cycles through various environments, including that of Meltdown and the disappearance of Hatsune Miku, further emphasizing these themes of destruction and self-alienation in relation to capitalism. But interestingly, while it features various ruins like these, World's End Dance Hall also displays lush green environments. So while it may seem nihilistic on the surface, especially when we consider that World's End Dance Hall is close to the end of the album Unhappy Refrain, in fact the narrative that began with Rolling Girl, carried through two-sided lovers and leads to this song, might have more optimistic or revolutionary possibilities than it at first appears. This can be considered in the double meaning of revolution as both circling or revolving, and as political revolution. Recalling the meaning of Megarine Luca's name, also, circling can be related to the ability to communicate a feeling or a scent through song. The choice of pairing Luca with Miku doesn't only invoke queer love, however problematic, it also counters the inability to communicate that punctuates two-sided lovers with a mutual understanding between these two characters, even if it begins in shared pain. The pink and blue colour scheme which was used in two-sided lovers to indicate heterosexuality and the gender binary is subverted in World's End Dance Hall to represent queer love, with blue representing Miku and pink representing Luca. The world's end might just be about a fantasy of escape and intoxication, but considering the verdant landscapes we see and the love that these women share, it may, linking back to Meltdown again, provide opportunities to build the world anew.
Project Diva Future Tone is a rhythm game where players have to press a series of buttons according to their sequence on the screen. The player is required to press the correct button once the coloured symbol lands on its grade version, and based on the player's timing, their accuracy is rated. In addition to those we've delved into today, there are a number of songs in Future Tone that explore themes of work, productivity, and alienation, including Happiness and Peace of Mind Committee, Hello Worker, and No Logic, to name only a few. As players, we are engaging in what is essentially a repetitive physical task set for us, a mindless worker. In a game context, this isn't so bad because it's our own recreational choice, and repetitive actions can actually be calming when your livelihood isn't on the line. But as we've established, when labour is coerced and done for reasons other than joy, the worker is alienated from themselves, from others, and from the work itself. The player being ranked for their accuracy is also reminiscent of work evaluations, or of being graded in school, which recalls our discussion of Rolling Girl. If you're interested in games that explore work and alienation in more narrative depth, check out the Stanley Parable. While Project Diva Future Tone might just be for fun, and these songs and videos clearly provide complex critiques of capitalism and its effect on our mental health and relationships, we would be amiss to detach the radical possibilities of the content from the capitalist context in which we consume games and music. Hatsune Miku is consistently one of the most popular characters in figurine and merchandise sales. She appears in adverts for corporations alongside international celebrities. Her songs are uploaded to Nico Nico, a streaming site which charges for subscriptions and partners with other corporations for ad revenue, much like YouTube. Their mere presence in this game means that the anti-capitalist content of the songs we've talked about is being exploited by corporations for money. On the producer's end, it can't really be helped. Under global capitalism, creatives have to use platforms like these to generate the money they need in order to survive. In our research, it was extremely difficult to find out what access to royalties producers of these songs actually have in the first place. To boot, the queer feminist politics of, say, World's End Dancehall or Two-Sided Lovers, and indeed the prevalence of female characters in Vocaloid, is at odds with an overwhelmingly male base of producers. While death in these songs might not be literal, and opens up revolutionary possibilities when we interpret it as the possible death of a violent social order, perhaps this paradox between anti-capitalist content and highly capitalist context is why there seems to be such difficulty in these songs imagining a future beyond capitalism. Hatsune Miku, and indeed her friends and her lovers, may not quite represent a nihilistic worldview, but the sound of the future is certainly working to confront capitalism for what it is, to express the violence it enacts on us, the ways in which it disables us. So fasten your seatbelts. Vocaloid may yet be the sound of the revolution. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you enjoyed it, please do give it a like and be sure to comment. As always, a huge thank you to our patrons who make videos like this possible. We genuinely couldn't do it without you. Special thanks to our ambassador patron, Najib Hassan, and of course, to B, not only for being a Tom Nook's sugar daddy patron, but for being an amazing project partner for this video. If you aren't a patron already, please consider supporting us over at patreon.com slash gameassistyt, and remember that top tier patrons can cameo in our videos in any way they feel comfortable. Catch us over on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for further discussions and conversations. And as always, thank you for watching. Take care.